morning. I remember homework. I remember it well, and uh, yeah. So many kids at uh, school really do not like homework, and uh, some beg me, "Can I just do it in class?" So no, that's why it's called homework. But my goal is not to torture my students. My goal is to create many learners for them to love to learn. And something I love to do is I love learning who God's Word is, uh, what it says. And when somebody asked me, I had a couple of students ask me, what's my favorite book? Because I'm teaching English. So they're asking, what's my favorite book? And I, I looked at them and like, can I say the Bible? I know it's like a cliche answer. And so I made it more specific. And I was like, well, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And I tend to go back to Job. Uh, Job has a lot of life lessons I like, so that's where we'll be at. We'll be at Job, so if you want to turn into your Bibles to the book of Job. If you don't know where the book of Job is, it's right after the book of Esther, and I believe it's right before Psalms. And we will be going through the entire book, so prepare to turn a lot of pages. And this is a four-hour sermon, so I hope you don't have any lunch plans, and I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Nope. There's three P's that you'll be hopefully memorizing today. That is petition, perseverance, and, uh, oh, what's that last one, honey? What is it called? What is it called? Oh, someone. Patience. 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 Kind of like perseverance, right? Sort of. Kind of the same word. Long suffering. That's why it's called long suffering. Perspective. That's the other word. I had to look at my text. Perspective. Perspective. Anybody going through some trials? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to admit it, but we all do. There's trials everywhere going around the world. Uh, In fact, this morning when I was running around with my head cut off, with uh, 50,000 things I, I had to do. I was uh, going in the store. I had to go get something real quick, and I ran into this guy, and I was like, I'm, I'm too busy for this. Like, this guy looks like he wants to talk to me. I don't know if I really want to talk to him right now because I'm really busy. Um, however, I heard you know God saying, just be still and know that I am God. Be still. And so I planted my feet, I looked him in the eye so that he could converse with me, and I I learned of his need. Uh, I learned that uh, he's gone through a lot of trials. Praise God, uh, he he believes in the Lord, and now he's just looking for help to get to work on time and have reliable transportation, so I'll be praying for him. And, you know, I wouldn't have known of his plight if I would have just rushed off and just said hi-bye. A lot of people do that now, or we say, how are you doing? And then you say it as you walk past them, because you don't really have time to actually wonder how they actually are doing. So that's why you be still, plant your feet, and look them in the eye, depending on their height, you know, move your eyeballs. But so the book of Job does a lot of things with trials. And so I want to hear, and Job 1.1 says, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God had shunned evil. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are God. I pray that you would speak through me and that all the ears, including my own, would hear, fear your word, obey it, and live it out. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are through trials and tribulations, whether it be sickness whether it be with uh, family members, whether it be with raising children, whatever it may be, you know of their suffering. And you did not promise that this life would be without it. And there is a purpose for it. And sometimes we forget what that is. Lord, I pray that you'd guide each one here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God calls Job a righteous man. And as you look at the story of Job, you quickly find out that he goes through trials of his own. His, uh, three servants run to him in succession of what happens. First, he loses most of his servants, right? And then he loses his land. 
and his crop and his animals. And then he loses all of his family members except for his wife. And there's a reason why that wife stayed around, why she didn't die. And you see that later. And you wonder, oh, is the book, this, this book is the book that will teach us why suffering happens to good people. For even God said in verse 1 that he is blameless and upright. And a lot of people make assumptions about this book. But we, what we learn at the beginning chapters is that Satan goes to heaven and he talks with God and he says that in Job 9 through 12, of, uh, he says, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And so what do you think God did? I know what a lot of us would like him to do is just toss him and be like, I'm not doing that. But that's not what God chooses. God decided, touch him, inflict him. You cannot touch his person, but you can touch the things, those blessings that are around him. And so Satan does. And that's why you have the death of the animals and the crop and the servants and the family members. All of his children die. And at this point in the story, this is what most of us wonder, why? Why? Why does God allow it? Because Satan had asked for permission. And God could have just said no, and Satan's hand cannot force God's hand. Right? And the question that we typically have of the why, that why, why did he allow it, goes to a deeper question, and that is, is God just? Is he just? That is the root question that is asked. And as we look through the book of Job, we see a few things. But first, let us visit another book, James. You don't have to turn there, say in Job. But James 1 Verse 2 and 3 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or long-suffering. There's a reason why it's called long-suffering. When you are being patient at Walmart or Meyer, and you're in, the, in line and there's 15 people ahead of you and one cashier and there's no apparently other cashiers that work in all of Walmart, they're all on their coffee break at the same time, right? Are you suffering? Yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I'm standing there, and I got stuff to do, and I'm waiting, and there's one cashier. I'm not mad at the cashier. I'm, I'm wondering, where's the other 15? I know they're back there. I work there. I know what y'all do, right? <laughs> That's what you're wanting. That's why it's called long-suffering. In the military, we have a phrase called, and I know some of y'all who serve, you know it, hurry up and wait. That's what hua means. Hurry up and wait. That's what it means. I'm telling you. And there's a reason for that, because you'll, I remember I, when I came back from deployment, we were waiting for the buses, and we had to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning for buses that didn't come until 6. So what did we do? We just huddled and fell asleep on each other in the parking lot. That's what happened, right? So this waiting, this long suffering, this patience. But James says when, when you fall. He doesn't say if. He does not say if you face various trials and tribulations. He says when, because you will. Again, I ask, how many of y'all are going through trials and tribulations right now? Some of y'all may be in moments of peace. But your past tells you that is not forever. Not yet. If you know the Lord Jesus, it is. Your eternity has already started. You can have joy in the midst of your circumstances. The reason being is that there's a hope. Earlier this year, uh, me and my wife lost our uh, child during a miscarriage. And when we got the news at the, in the office, you know, the doctor came in. We were kind of wondering what was going on because no one really taught us about this stuff, about miscarriages and such, so we were kind of blindsided. And uh, we, we just, the doctor came in and just said, there's no heartbeat. The, the child is gone. And uh, I was appreciative of the, you know, the information right on because if he would have beat around the bush, I think I would have done something that was not okay. But he gave it right just as it is. And I'm glad that what Art said here to the little children is to, to learn while you're young. Because as you learn the word of God young, as you're young, your responses hopefully will mimic something like my circumstance where instead of, instead of cursing God, I said, God giveth and taketh away. 
I could have easily cursed God, but because my mind was set on Jesus, that's what came out of my mouth instead. And it was painful. It's probably the hardest thing I have gone through. But I knew that God gave the life. There's a reason why God took it, and I didn't have to know. God giveth and taketh away is what is in Job 121. So is God just? Is God just for taking a child when they haven't experienced this life? What about your trial and your tribulation that you're going through? Whether you can't find a job, you can't find the spouse, or whether your, your relationship, your marriage is not working, or your children are disobedient, or whatever. Is God just to do that? Do you see God as just in that? Because no matter what God is, he's, he is God, whether you like it or not. Whether you agree of the truths of the scripture is not up to you. It is true. It's just true. But you have to make the decision whether you're going to believe it or not. Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Remember, suffering comes about because of Adam and Eve. Remember when Eve took of the fruit in Genesis, the tree that, he sh that God warned, do not eat of it. Do not eat of it. Why? Why did he give the tree? That's the, another question that people ask. Like, why, do you, why even put the tree? Because he wanted free choice to be an option. Otherwise, we'd be robots. He didn't want to push a button and you just obey, right? Parents, grandparents, whoever is a guardian who take, takes care of children, how much honor do we receive when our child does something when we don't have to tell them? It's amazing. Like now, Genesis is not even two, two this month, and she'll put away her toys, and I don't have to, I don't have to tell her. At times, she'll just start putting them away, right? How much honor do you receive from that? Do you say, oh, no, that's terrible? No, of course not. You see how much of a blessing it is. Yet they chose wrongly. Eve gave of the fruit. And some people will wonder, well, that means Eve, that means ladies, you started it. You started it. But remember, men, guys, the Bible says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. But the scripture said that Adam was there. Right there. Supposed to be the leader of the household, and yet a, did not warn, did not stop his wife. And took of the fruit himself, and he ate. And this is the curse that's been passed from generation to generation, where now we have the seed of sin. And in Genesis 3.17, God said, Cursed is the ground for your sake, talking to Adam. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But there is hope. God did not stay the God of just wrath for us. God gave a way out. And in fact, Genesis goes on to say that he kicks them out of the garden because there's the tree of life. So what happens if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and you sin and then you eat the tree of life? That means you live forever in sin. So he kicks them out. But he gives us a way. He gives us the seed of hope, the Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, with himself restored, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. If you are saved today, Peter's talking to you. God is talking to you. You are restored. You will be restored. He will establish you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you. And so as we go through Job, we see the, the trials, and he calls out. He does not curse God. And instead, he says, God take it and give it away. And he lost a lot. Some of you have lost a lot. But then there's a couple of friends that come on the scene. A couple of friends come on the scene. And sometimes, so, this, so you got to remember the context. This is the, the advice that the three friends give is the best advice of Near Eastern thought, of Near Eastern thinking. That is their thought process. So when they ask the questions, their three questions revolve around, is God just? The second friend asks, does God 
uh, work, the universe, is it all in control? Is it, does he work on the principle of justice for the whole universe? So is God just of himself? And does the universe revolve around this principle of justice? And the third question is, why suffering? Like, why is Job suffering? That is the question. Why is he suffering if these things are true? Remember to discern from people who say they are going to give wise counsel, right? This is not an invitation of do not seek only but God. Of course you should, but God has given, if you are a Christian and you have wise people in your life, hopefully they are talking to you by God's counsel in them, right? Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22 says, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Here is an example of using discernment, what is true and what is not, because these three friends, the wisdom they're given, it all boils down to, Job, you must have sinned. You must have sinned because God is just, and he the whole universe is based on this justice of his. That means you must have sinned. This is the best advice they have. But Job pleads and says, I am innocent. I have brought my petition to the Lord, right? That's the other P, petition. He has asked God to search his heart, and there has been no accusation. And even God himself in one one says that Job was blameless, upright. Job doesn't know that this stuff is happening in heaven. He doesn't have that perspective. Job's mind goes through a, a roller coaster of emotions, as you see throughout the word. You, you see him standing up for God before his friends and, and claiming that he has done nothing wrong against his God. But then you see several different verses like in Job 9, 22 through 23, he says, It is all one thing. Therefore, I say he destroys the blameless and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, he laughs at the plight of the innocent. He's talking about God, whom he was defending. Job 16, 9, he tears me in his wrath and hates me. He gnashes at me with his teeth. My adversary sharpens his gaze on me. And Job 27, 2, he says, As God lives, who t- has taken away my justice and the Almighty Who has made my soul bitter? This is a person who God found to be upright, blameless. And the reason he makes these statements is because there's a giant assumption that he has that because his friends say it must have been a sin, then there's two things that are happening. Either God is just simply unjust or he doesn't revolve the universe around justice. There's no explanation. It's a giant question mark. But there's this big assumption that Job has. And he thinks he knows the answer. He, he, his assumption is basically what he thinks God ought to do. How many of us have done that? We go through some circumstance. I know me and my wife, I know I could have easily said God should, should uh, just not given us a child and to take one away. He created the life. Why give it to us? And when you say that, when you do that, you pretend to be God. You take his role that is not yours. Remember that we are created beings. In Job 38, 1 through 2, I think... I think 38 and 39, the chapters 38 and 39 of Job is my favorite two chapters because God shows up. But before that, there's a, an interesting character that comes in, Elihu, or El- Elihu, however you pronounce it, right? He comes in, and he's another friend, not with the first three friends. He's another friend that comes in, and he does something different. He agrees with the three friends that he says that God is just, and he does operate the universe with this principle of justice. However, he, changed, he changes the conclusion. He goes on to say, he doesn't assume why Job is suffering, but he thinks maybe it's a warning for others of what happens if you were to sin. It's a warning for, to d- deter from future sin. But this much he knows, and he tells Job, this much he knows is that you ought not to assume what God should do, that God is God. 
I heard it once said when I was at the World of Life Bible Institute that a professor said, friends are not friends unless they point you closer to Christ. Does that mean that you have no non-Christian friends? No, of course not, but you're probably not going to go there for the biggest decisions in your life that uh, you want godly counsel for. If you didn't have any non-Christian friends, then how are you going to share the gospel with anybody? So Job 38 and 39, I, uh, I really particularly like Job 38, verses 1 through 2, who said, uh, God says, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Oof. Do you imagine if you were one of the friends trying to give advice and God said that about you? Think before you talk. If you're going to give advice, make sure you pray on that advice. And then he goes on and says, I will question you, and you shall answer me. Because in the previous chapter, in, in chapter 37, Job starts saying all these things, like he assumes what God is doing. So he has this whole chapter where he just assumes what God is doing. He makes all these statements throughout the whole chapter. And starting in verse 1 of chapter 37, At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Hear attentively the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He sends it forth under the whole heaven, his lightning to the ends of the earth. And he starts assuming what God does to make some sense about what he is going through. The biggest question me and my wife had was why? Why? And a lot of the trials you're going through, the tribulations, the struggles can be boiled down to why? Almost like a five-year-old who asks all the time, why, 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 why? And they just repeat it. We do the same thing with our Heavenly Father because we want to know why. What is the purpose of this? And so Job comes down and he says he will question, or God comes down and he wants to question Job. And he, he gives a picture, 38, 39, those chapters, of what God actually does, and he challenges Job. He says in 38.4, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? 38.12, Have you commanded the morning since the days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Job 38.25, Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the thunderbolt? Be careful of what you assume about God because God may show up. And you might not like it when he does. And God even goes so far as to challenge Job to be God for a day. In chapter 40, verse 11 through 12, he says, Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Challenging him to see if Job can do that. Job knows he can't. Job repents. Knows that he has spoken before God with unclean lips. And that is the point that God has here is to humble him, to remind him of his place. Sometimes we just need a reminder. And then God goes in and describes what are two, one of two ancient creatures known, uh, said throughout the uh, Old Testament. You can see it in Isaiah and in Psalms, and then you see it here in Job. Uh, one of the creatures was behemoth. And he describes the behemoth. And the reason he describes it is he describes earth like it. That it is beautiful and there's order. There's also disorder and danger. God is still in control. But remember, because sin came in, sin did not just affect me and you. It affected the whole of creation. Remember in Revelation it says the lion will lay down with the lamb. You will not see that today. Unless if... There's something weird going on, but you're not going to see that. Job 40, verse 15 says, Look at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. Shows the beauty of it. But don't get too close to the behemoth. You might get hurt. So what is the answer then? Everybody who looks at the book of Job wonders. Even the wife who was kept alive, said to Job, curse him that you may die, because Satan went back to heaven 
and asks, I want to touch him because he has not cursed you yet. Satan wants Job to curse God, to prove to God that he is not righteous as he seems. And so God allows it again. And even the wife sees the suffering of his husband. And what seems as wise counsel is not. Curse God that you may die. Some of you have seen and watched loved ones die. I have. And it is one of the most painful experiences that you can endure. However, God is still in control within that. God is not done with you and whatever you're going through. And instead of heeding his wife's words, he decided to continue to praise God within the midst. Yeah, he said some uh, outlandish things, assuming what God is doing, but he did not curse God. So what's the answer then to the question, is God just? What's the purpose of good people suffering? Remember, the scripture says, there is none that, ha- that are good, no, not one. Even your good deeds are like filthy rags. Remember that we have sinned, but praise God, if you know Jesus, you are redeemed. You are wiped clean, as white as snow. The answer is quite different than what we expect. We think that God is going to answer why is there suffering, but he's already answered that back in Genesis. When Adam took of the fruit and ate. He already answered the question. There is suffering because there is sin. Instead, his answer is perspective. And he shows Job that the world is complex. Your simple words do not describe what I actually do. You cannot have a thought on what, how I ought to operate because you are not God. And that's why when we see in the New Testament, trust in him, it's called trust. It doesn't mean replace. It doesn't mean you take God's throne. It means you submit to God. As we wrap up this morning, I want you to think about three words. Perseverance. Some of you are going through some mighty trials and tribulations persevere. God is not done with you. God will not give you something you cannot handle. There is always an exit door. We just saw that with our missionaries that we saw in the video. There was a way out. Praise God for him. There are missionaries who die and Christians who die around the world all the time. God's not done with them and there's a reason for every death. Whatever God has you go through, persevere. How do I persevere? Well, for one, Olympians Youth Group teaches them that by leaning on God. If you lean on yourself, you will fail. Guaranteed. Because we don't have all power. Only God does. The next one is perspective. Have the right perspective. Don't be like the horse that's racing that has the blinders on the sides to keep with the distractions. Have your eyes open. Have perspective. You're not going to have God's perspective, but have perspective on where you are placed in relationship with God, within relationship with the world and the universe. With all the things that are around, know that God died for you on the cross. I see teens all the time fighting about something that is incredibly simple. And then I, I come from a different angle, and they're like, whoa, I didn't see that. And the reason is because they didn't step back to have perspective. Adults do it too. Right, honey? I do it too. Yeah. I get narrow-minded sometimes. I get tunnel vision. Good thing she reminds me. And the last one is petition. You no longer have to, like in the Old Testament, go to a priest for someone to pray for you. The veil has been torn. You have the opportunity to pray whenever you want. And when you're driving, don't do like I heard someone do and close your eyes, right? Have your eyes open, but you don't have to have a specific way to pray. You don't have to have your eyes closed and bowed or whatever. If that's how you do it, then fine, but just don't drive while you do it. But you have an opening to pray whenever. 
you have the opportunity to have that petition before God. I had the opportunity at Word of Life before the passing of the last founder of Word of Life to pray with Harry Ballback. He uh, lived on campus uh, in a cabin, and he would sometimes give the chapel service, and I went to him. And, uh, you know, I was new to the campus, and I sat down with him. And uh, I can only count a couple of people in my life where I've been able to pray with them and felt like I was in the presence of God. Not before Harry Ballback, you know, not seeing him as God, but the fact that when I prayed, and some of this happens to you guys too, quite often. When you pray, you have 50 other things going on in your mind, and your prayer is distracted because you have all this stuff going on. But when I was praying with him, it was proof that he had devoted his life to God because I, I had no distractions. I could hear the authority in his voice relying on God and his word. So my challenge to you this, to this day is, the trials and tribulations that you have going on, or the future ones, how will you respond? You won't be able to control everything in your life, and most of the time you won't be able to at all. But you can control your reactions. How do you respond to what God is doing in your life? There's a purpose behind it. And teach this to the new generation. There's a generation dying, not knowing God's word. I have no idea who the name of Jesus is. I've, I've run out into people in New York who have never heard of the name of Jesus, and it's quite astounding. Teach the younger generation. Because when we go, they will take over and teach them well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we think of you this morning. We thank you for your presence in this place. There are many trials and tribulations going on in our lives now and in the future we know they're coming for you say it in your word when they come. And I ask that you give us strength. Give us the correct perspective. Teach us those assumptions we have that are faulty. Help us to come to you and petition first before we go to other people who we think are wise so that we may, we may discern whether it is good wisdom or not. Let us go to you first in all things. Help us to persevere. Give us the strength to, to move forward through them and then to see the blessing on the other end. As hard as it may be for us, we know that you are good, that you are just. And because of that justice, you did not leave us in our sin, but that you sent your son to die on the cross for my sin. I thank you so much for that salvation. I pray that if anybody here has not heard of the gospel and does not know that Jesus died on the cross for them, that he rose on the third day, and that he is alive now at the right hand of the Father, I pray that they would pray this, and that they would re receive salvation today. For we are not promised tomorrow. All we have is now. And I pray that if anybody has made that prayer, that they would seek you first, and then come and talk to somebody about the decision. And if they have questions, to talk to somebody about that as well. We love you and we praise you and we pray that we would live this out in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.